In late October, I was on Reverb searching through and something caught my eye. A very vaguely titled Gibson Les Paul 2001 Wood. But when I clicked on it, it's one of those early Tobey Maguire Spider-Man Les Pauls. So I thought that was a really strange way to advertise such a piece. So the next thing I do, check out the seller. Brand new account, freshly made, with a description as follows. The pictures show photos of an identical guitar. The one that is for sale has never been out of the original packaging. Uh-oh, super red flags. Somebody selling a rare Les Paul with photos not of the actual guitar sending you a sealed box. My response here was really easy. And Reverb acted quick, took the listing down, but I had still saved it in my watch list, and to my surprise, about a week later, it goes back up. The exact same listing, which means Reverb has cleared it, even though their listing standards clearly state that you cannot use someone else's photos. So I found that rather odd. Maybe that slipped through the system. But every day I'm looking at Reverb, and I'm saving things in my watch list. As I was creating these episodes, this one caught my attention again. It's like, wow, that's still there? I cannot believe that. Because I'm 100% sure that is a scam listing. So I decided to do some scam baiting. They're asking six grand, I throw them a funny, funny $1,500 offer because usually a scammer would jump on that if they're going to send you a box with a toy guitar and ammonia in it. But to my surprise, they let it expire. Then another couple weeks go by and I start to think, what if this is real? You might be able to get a really good deal on this. So I decided to get a little bit more serious here, threw them a 2,500 and this time they countered 35, which made me think this schemer's trying to get some more money. But now the next time I actually get real texts from the person saying, oh, it's never been out of original packaging, never touched. And then I had to respond, well, that's what kind of scares me. <laughs> There's a lot of risk here. And they say, yeah, I hear ya, but if you make it 3,000, we'll call it a deal. And just for your guys' viewing pleasure, I decided to take the risk. And this is what shows up. A guitar-sized box that has a label dating to late 2002, 8 of 9, addressed to Sony Picture Entertainment from Gibson Custom. I thought for sure this was a scam. Why'd this person have to be so cryptic? At least post a couple of photos of the sealed box and then have a few pictures of other ones. But assuming the guitar is actually in this box, things might make a little bit more sense once we learn the history. So, it's the early Gibson Custom Art Historic case. We only had a couple of years left of that style. I mean, this thing is so minty fresh. Even the handle, like, stays put in all the directions. I've never got to experience that before, because I'm sure those get worn in. But let's see, did Gibson put the right guitar in? Oh my goodness, guys. Yeah, it's legit. It's real. <laughs> this one's got such a cool story to it. All right, let's learn about the Spider-Man guitars. There are tons of Spider-Man guitars out there. We've actually documented a really cool spider staying from the Fender family of brands, but there's offshoots and knockoffs and just a whole bunch of superheroes. But within Gibson lore, there are two official Spider-Man Les Pauls. The first one was a limited edition run of 150. They were produced in 1999 under the codename Web Slinger 1. It's the amazing Spider-Man hearkening back to the original comic book style. Half of them were signed by Stan Lee, the creator of Spider-Man, and the other half by John Romita, the artist. That one's pretty cool with the spiderweb inlay design and the spider on the headstock, but it always bothered me that the whole top of that is just a bolt-on graphic. It's like the really cheesy, not-so-good promo guitars, and we're smack dab in the golden era of Gibson promo things. For example, the Yahoo Explorer, Playboy Bunnyhead guitar, among all these other ones that we've talked about many a times. But rather than being a promo guitar, these were sold to the public in that limited run and they had an MSRP of $3,500. And they also had a giveaway contest where you could win one of these. However, following that up about three years later for the 2002 Spider-Man movie, we have the one we're talking about today. This was never publicly available for sale. Gibson crafted 15 of these to be used in promotional giveaways and to be given to some members of the cast and crew. One was also auctioned off for charity, so you couldn't buy one of these. And I think that's why these have a little bit of a cult following. And because the 2002 Spider-Man movie, while it's probably nobody's number one favorite movie, it's definitely not the worst one they ever made. And there's a bunch of fun memes surrounding it with Bully Maguire. <laughs> I particularly enjoy watching 
watching those. Check them out on YouTube. The other thing I've always liked about this one is how many fakes there are out there in the world. You can actually buy these on AliExpress today, and most of them that you see show up are counterfeit examples. I was fully expecting one of those things in the case, but no, this is 100% legit. And the other thing I always felt these had over the first run is the fact that this is not a bolted on graphic. It's just a graphic they put underneath the finish. So a little bit more premium in that aspect. Now let's check out the condition of this thing. Left untouched in the case for over 20 years. Look at the state of the frets. It really reminds me of that auction 360 estate when we had to clean up the Hurricane Katrina Les Paul. And you can tell it's never actually been played because as you rub the strings on it, it rubs some of the corrosion away and sounds terrible. But uh oh, is my neck falling off? I don't think so. That might just be the graphic shrinking and now we can see the maple wood underneath. But wait till you see the strap buttons. Jeez. Do not lock your guitars away in your case, people. Over time, the thing will just off-gas itself. And I wonder if it's just because it was new before the lacquer fully cured and it off-gassed more so than it normally would. But what I do find strange is why didn't the pickup covers frost over like everything else? Even the tuners are all frosted over, but here we can see our serial number dating it to 2002, and this one was number 6 of 10. So it might be that the promotional ones were numbered differently, or maybe the internet's wrong about that whole 15 thing. But now let's talk about this thing as a guitar. It's basically an R4 reissue out of the custom shop, meaning a 1954 replica, because we got the wrap tail piece. Now it's one of the more Gibson USA intonatable style ones, and then you'd have to route out the P90s for the humbuckers, so it's really basically its own thing, because it doesn't really have that big of a neck to call it an R4. But you don't have any binding on the headstock. It's just a cool little spider guy, which I love animal influence Les Pauls, so that's a nice little touch brought over from the initial web slinger ones. And then this shocked me. I always thought these were black backs. No, it's a dark back, so really dark maroon color. But what kind of case candy do we got? We've got the original case key and truss rod tool, the hang tag that was on the guitar until I just took it off, customer care guide and pre-packed checklist filled out as LP Spider-Man, giant silica packet. And lo and behold, I don't think I've actually seen one of these guitars still retain the giant COA. Look at our little Spider-Man dude there. With a matching serial number, this was a great find. And it still has this. Yeah, the custom shop used to come with a cable, a nice polishing cloth, picks, vintage tags. You don't get this anymore. So there we go. Sometimes you do get lucky taking risks. <laughs> Although I would not normally suggest taking a risk like this. But I just figure, you know, if it turned into a scam, haha, ha, funny video content, and I can get my money back. But now it turns into great new addition with a really quirky story. So that's why it makes sense why it was maybe sold so cryptically, because it might have been somebody who didn't really know a lot about guitars and how to properly list them with the keywords and everything. So this one now has a very unique story behind it. Well, let's go ahead, throw it onto the workbench, see what type of TLC it might need to actually be functional, and then we'll get to that playing sample. If you're upset that I cleaned this, well, I missed the part where that's my problem. <laughs> Here it is, the Spider-Man, back to the way it's supposed to be. Some interesting phenomenons are going on with this thing, but first, let's start with our pickups. The gold's looking nice, but it was never really tarnished to begin with. But it appears we're rocking a 57 Classic in the neck, and the same in the bridge position. Whoa, okay, maybe I'm wrong. It's not 57 Classics. Get 12.58k ohms in the bridge, 7.74 in the neck, and 4.8 in the middle. That nearly looks like the readings of like the 490R, 490AT, but those don't have that. Do we have a signature Spider-Man bridge pickup? Because that reading does not match what you normally associate a pup with that decal. Inside the neck pickup cavity, we can see the long neck tenon, so yes, this does indeed have historic construction. You can see the maple block capping off our truss rod route, and they didn't mess with the formula of the Les Paul, still have the maple top and the mahogany body. But I love the early 2000s, they just have such nice looking woods. It's a shame we had to cover it over, but that's some nice mahogany. And the bridge pickup route looks like this. But again, look how nice that looks. And that's just with a little bit of a clear coat. It's still quite a rich color, even where it didn't get finish. But here we can see the center seam, so it should be a two-piece top. Here's a look at our lightning bar wrap tail. Like a special or looking at a little goblin junior here. Gonna cry about your intonation. Now you're just gonna rock it back and forth to get it as best as you can. But the lightning bar does help with that. That cleaned up nicely, no longer frosty. 
Then there was a little bit of dirt in his eye that we cleaned off, but it's nice and shiny now. But I do want to talk about this area. So this does appear to be just the decal that is shrinking. So there's the bolt-on graphics that you usually don't have problems with, because usually it's like a clear pick guard over top of like a piece of paper. See the baseball Les Paul episode. But for the ones with graphics that they actually lay on the guitar that stick on and then they finish over top of, such as the race car car guitar, over time you get cracks and tears within it because the decal ages and it shrinks. On top of that, nitro finishes also age and move in differing ways. So you tend to get these like finish check slash crack lines in your decals and the decals do shrink. Some of it's just natural, it's gonna happen no matter what. Other times there's like more extreme examples than this one where it gets really bad because it wasn't properly stored. So that is not a repair, that's just a slightly shrinking decal. However, as I was cleaning this, I noticed that the binding was just so chewed up and nasty feeling. Like, what is this ridge? It's quite common on like these brand new guitars of the time to have like some buffing compound around the edge. But I was baffled until I took a really close look. What we're seeing there is actually the maple top. The whole decal has shrunk around the entire guitar. That's not leftover buffing compound, that's just the natural maple wood showing, which is kind of hilarious. I like it. Now in some areas like around the cutaway, we don't necessarily have that yet. So it's also possible it was just a sloppy install job, but knowing the history of these decal promo guitars, probably a combination of both. But too bad it wasn't like a flamed maple top, so we have like a little flame maple purfling along the edge. These are not dings in the top, it's just where the graphic didn't get fully secured or maybe there's some contamination underneath the finish. There's too many of those to be anything else. So as you get it in the light just right, it's mainly just in like your arm playing area. They did a pretty decent job over here. Until we get over there and then you can see some more of the shrinking slash crack lines. They always happen in the high stress areas like where the pickup ring gets secured and the tailpiece. And then now that you know to look for it, you can also see the plain maple top a little bit along the ledge right here as well. But having this photo in person, I've come to appreciate it a little bit more because you got the main Spidey dude, right? But you also have his reflections. So it's double your Spidey fun. I never realized that there was something like right there because it's mainly covered up by your pickup. But moving on from our mahogany body two piece maple top, we've got the mahogany neck with the rosewood fretboard. It was a labor of love, but wow, yeah, these frets shine. And you will be happy to know I kept the original strings just because it's pretty much confirmed that's what they left the factory with. Usually I don't care about stuff like that because it's really hard to prove, but this one was a sealed box. It looks like this might be that Madagascar rosewood. Got that interesting streaking to it, and they were using that in the early 2000s. So I get a nut width of 1.71 inches, 2.06 by the 12th. First fret neck depth 0.87, then 0.94 by the 12th. Here's a look at that neck profile, first fret and 12th fret. It's definitely not a giant baseball bat neck, just a nice rounded C shape. And now our cool headstock. Got our spooky spider, as well as our mother of pearl Gibson logo. But that's how this one left the factory, truss rod wise. And here's a look at our truss rod cover. It's just your usual one. And yeah, I took the tuners off to clean them. They were just too hazy looking when this guitar hasn't been played enough to earn that. It was just neglect that gave it the haze, but now these things are just looking great. However, the washers must be plated or be made of a different material than the rest. When you cleaned it off, the corrosion just took all the gold with it. Same thing with the strap buttons. I mean, as they took the off gassing, all the gold is just gone. But yet the screws are just fine. But at least now the strap buttons don't feel terrible. They had a weird powdery, like they're falling apart feel to them before. Now they just feel smooth. Other things like the output jack nut also had a similar coloration to it. Moving on to the backside, it's a nice dark molasses color. Deep brown with a little bit of red, that's what a dark back is within Gibson land. But when you can see through to the mahogany, it's just like what we were seeing in the pickup cavities. Nice and dense. Now this one's got some, I've been sitting in a case scratches, being jostled around, but nothing too crazy. And I was expecting something much worse than this control cavity. This just looks like most normal guitars that get left out on a stand, but the Gibson branded pots, we don't have the bumblebee capacitors yet. They must have been running low on solder that day because that's just barely enough to attach to the pot, but everything works. That bridge pickup, I'm drawing a blank on what it could even be. Maybe it's just a accidentally wound too hot 57 classic. And here's our output jack plate being made of black plastic. 
and our strap buttons reinstalled. The neck also has a few blemishes from sitting in the case, but it's the exact same color. However, going to the back side of the headstock, I realized something here. This is different from all the other ones that have shown up. So we still have our Gibson Custom Shop decal. That's fine. However, I went to the Guitar Motel because I know he owns one too. We checked him out in this episode. He's got a great collection. His does not have that. It's printed underneath the serial number. Limited edition, what number it is, out of 15. But this one specifically says Columbia Pictures 6 of 10. And if you hunt around on YouTube, you can actually see a guy playing prototype number two. So here's my hypothesis. They made 15 of them as a limited edition giveaway. They made 10 of them for executives. And maybe this one was locked away till very recently. And that's why it popped up on Reaver for very cheap. But it went to somebody that had something to do with the movie. And then at least two prototypes. So that means there should be at minimum 27 of these things out there, which is different from what we knew previous to today. And it appears the Columbia Pictures batch came afterward, as I compared the serial number to a different one. But this is CS2-1906, so it's the 1906 guitar made that year in 2002. That makes three different runs you could potentially collect for, the Columbia Pictures, the giveaway units, and the prototypes. But all said and done, this one weighs 9 pounds, 3.6 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how the Spider-Man sounds. was fun. I didn't even realize that song was made for this movie. It's just looking at this guitar just makes me think of that. So I think I can confirm this is something completely custom or a 57 classic gone wrong because that is really raunchy. <laughs> That's the clean channel. <laughs> In comparison to your neck. That works great for distorted stuff. I want to play Megadeth on this for some reason, too. Thank <laughs> you. 
So there we go, the ever-elusive Spider-Man Les Paul from 2002 created for the movie. You know, I'm really glad I picked this up and took the chance because I would have never have paid like the regular market retail rate for one of these that was like fully vetted. It's just not the kind of guitar I wanted to drop that money into, but picking it up for what I did, I'm just gonna hold on to this because it just brings me good memories for some reason, even though I'm not a big Spider-Man fan or this particular movie outside of the memes. But the song this one reminds me of, I'm a fan of that one. So I think that's why I've fallen in love with this weird kind of goofy guitar. It's definitely not for everyone. It's more of a collector's piece and a bragging rights thing. I mean, you can find somebody who will make you a skin for your regular guitar if you really want one of these, but don't want to shell out collector's money or if you just can't find one. But at the same time, it also kind of fits into my animal influenced collection because I mean, there's a spider on the headstock. <laughs> so there's a few reasons to love this one. So all right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoy your newfound guitar knowledge. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.